It's January 22nd, 1879. The mountainside at Isanduana is littered with the mutilated remains of nearly 1,300 British soldiers. High on confidence from their outstanding victory, a Zulu impi breaks away from the main Zulu army and defies their king's orders by attacking a small British garrison stationed on the banks of the Buffalo River. Heavily outnumbered and facing an enemy fresh from victory, how did this small garrison defy the odds and hold out against a mighty Zulu force? This is the true story of the Battle of Rourke's Drift. On January the 11th, 1879, after receiving an unsatisfactory response to their ultimatum from King Chetsweo, the British army under the command of Lord Chelmsford invaded Zululand, thus sparking the Anglo-Zulu Wars, for which I give a more detailed account in my previous video on the Battle of Isandluana, which you can check out in the link below. By January the 21st, the British centre column consisting of some 4,700 men had made camp on the lower slopes of the mountain of Isandluana. News reached Chelmsford late on the evening of the 21st that a large Zulu force had been sighted in the direction of the King's Corral on the road to Alundi. Eager for a quick and decisive engagement, Chelmsford split his force and took off in pursuit of the Zulu force early on the 22nd, leaving some 1,700 men to defend the camp at Isandluana. However, as Chelmsford's force drove ever deeper into Zululand, the main Zulu army used the hilly terrain and scrubland to evade and bypass Chelmsford's column to attack the hopelessly exposed camp. Some 20,000 warriors descended on the force at Isandluana with great ferocity, and in a few short hours they had completely overwhelmed and annihilated the British force. Those few who escaped were relentlessly pursued by the King's own Zulu Impi, known as the Alundi Corps. As the Impi reached the banks of the Buffalo River, they could see the lightly garrisoned British forward supply station at Rourke's Drift. Buoyed by their overwhelming success at Isan Luana, some 4,500 warriors of the Alundi Corps defied their king, who expressly forbade any cross-border attack by his army, and advanced on Rourke's Drift. By early afternoon on the 22nd, two weary survivors from the Battle of Isandluana, a Lieutenant Ardendorf of the Natal Native Contingent, and a trooper of the Natal Mounted Police, reached Rourke's Drift, bearing the news of the British massacre, and warned its officers, Lieutenants Chard and Bromhead, of the Zulu Impi approaching from the southeast. Shocked by this information, Chard and Bromhead, with the aid of Commissary Dalton, quickly decided that abandoning the mission station was folly, and that fortifying the position and awaiting the Zulu onslaught would be their best chance of survival. The initial British garrison was made up of a mixture of men from B Company, 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment of Foot, the Royal Artillery and Army Service Corps, totalling around 140 men. The mission station consisted of a hospital, storehouse and cattle kraal, with a hastily constructed wall of mealy bags connecting each to form an outer perimeter. In the event the outer perimeter would be breached, Chard also ordered the construction of an inner perimeter formed from biscuit boxes to split the compound with a final redoubt nine foot high made as a point of last stand. At 3.30pm to the relief of the garrison, some 100 riders of the Natal native horse under the command of Lieutenant Henderson arrived at the station after a long retreat from Isan Luana. Upon being briefed about the imminent Zulu attack, Henderson agreed to picket the southern slopes of the Oscarburg Hill, which overlooked the mission station, to stunt the Zulu attack. Now with the aid of the cavalry, the British force anxiously waited to face the impending onslaught. 
At 4.20pm, the opening shots of the battle were fired by Henderson and his troop as they engaged the Zulu vanguard sweeping around the Oscarberg. However, weary from their earlier fight at Isan Luana, the mounted horse soon fled the battlefield in the direction of Help Makar, abandoning the remaining British garrison to fight it out alone. At 4.30pm, the Zulus launched their first attack on the garrison. The Zulu vanguard charged head-on into the south rampart, while the main body of the Zulu force swept around the left flank and attacked the north wall. As the Zulus ferociously tried to breach the barricade, they were met with devastating volley fire and were swiftly driven back to the shelter of the tall grass surrounding the mission station. Angered by their initial failure, the Zulu force renewed its attack with tremendous aggression and smashed head-on into the hospital and north wall. To add to British fears, the south wall now came under sporadic Zulu musket fire from atop the Oscarberg, pinning the defenders down. Fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat erupted along the perimeter, but by 6pm, realising they couldn't hold out much longer, Chard ordered a withdrawal to the inner perimeter. Around this time, several Zulu warriors broke into the hospital. Realising they were about to be overrun, Private John Williams desperately hacked an escape route through the wall into the adjacent room, whilst Private Joseph Williams held back several Zulu warriors. John Williams, in the nick of time, managed to drag himself and two patients into a room occupied by Private Hook and nine other patients. However, as Joseph Williams attempted to follow, he was dragged out and killed by a number of warriors. While Private Hook heroically held off several warriors, John Williams quickly hacked another escape route through the walls and into a room defended by Private Waters, who helped the eleven patients to momentary safety. Now occupying a cramped room, and with the thick smoke of the now burning hospital roof scorching at their lungs, Williams hacked a final escape route into a large room defended by Privates William and Robert Jones. From here, as Huck and the two Joneses fought off the intruders, Williams, with the aid of Waters, helped the patients escape through a window and make their retreat to the inner perimeter, completing the hospital evacuation. In total, the hospital escape cost the lives of one defender and two patients. As night fell, the Zulu attacks intensified, forcing the British to abandon the corral and rally near the redoubt. The only saving grace for the weary defenders was the light of the burning hospital, which illuminated the battlefield and stripped the Zulus of the element of surprise. By 2am, the Zulu attack finally faded. However, at first light on the 23rd, the Zulu impi reappeared in imposing fashion. Fearing another onslaught, the British took up positions one last time. But to their astonishment, the Zulu impi simply turned around and withdrew a move likely influenced by the appearance of Lord Chelmsford's relief column approaching from Isan Luana, thus concluding the Battle of Rourke's Drift. In total, the battlefield at Rourke's Drift was littered with the bodies of some 600 brave Zulu warriors. The British, by contrast, lost just 17 brave men in the bitter struggle. The battle would later go down in British history, as one of magnificent British courage in the face of overwhelming odds, and to add to its splendour, eleven of its participants would go on to receive the Victoria Cross for their heroic actions. Subscribe for more awesome content, and let me know in the comment section below what historical battles would you like me to cover next. As always, thanks for watching.